All right, hi everyone. So it's great to be here and great to start this conference off. So an apology first that this is a bit different from the session title on property, but it is still a question about financial regulation, so I hope that nonetheless everyone will find it acceptable. So my talk is titled Competition Policy and Price Discovery. So based off a paper I wrote, actually my job. So what I'm trying to do here is to basically ask. Markets are used basically for for, for, for two reasons. So markets are used to allocate resources, but independently of their resource and resource allocation, their role in resource allocation, they're also used to discover prices. So a lot of prices that these markets discover, independently of their role in allocating resources, are independently very valuable for guiding what we do in the economy. So here's some examples of extremely important prices. Let's take stock indices, the Dow Jones, NASDAQ, S&P 500. Let's take prices of foreign currencies, prices of commodities, prices of government bonds. So these are basically prices, or price benchmarks, where you take trades of some kind of asset, be it equities, be it foreign currencies, or be it oil, and you use that to construct a price benchmark. And besides the fact that these prices come out of these trades, we look at these prices and use them to tell us a lot about how the economy is doing. And so not only do we kind of use these informally in order to diagnose, sort of, in order to set expectations on what the economy is doing, we write a lot of contracts tied to these prices. There's a lot of derivative contracts, futures, options, swap contracts, where we, we basically bet on how the economy is doing by writing contracts with payoffs tied to these prices. So the problem with this system is that if market prices were unmanipulable, if market prices could not be moved by anyone in the economy, this system would be a pretty good system for basically, for basically ensuring us against various things that can happen in the economy. But large agents in markets have the power to move these prices. And then when agents are holding contracts tied to these prices, agents might have incentives to manipulate these prices in order to change the payoffs of the various contracts they have tied to these prices. So basically, many of these benchmarks have been manipulated or suspected of manipulation at some point in the past. FX benchmarks have been manipulated. Gold and silver prices have been manipulated. Um, crude oil, VIX has been manipulated. Any time that you're using a price as the basis for some kind of something other than resource allocation, somebody is going to have some incentive to go in and try and move that price around. So what's an example? Let's assume that somebody has a large bet based on a market price. And let's look at what the agent's incentives are to move that price around. Here's an example with uh, numbers taken from a natural gas price benchmark. So basically, there is a natural gas price benchmark based in Houston, Texas. And it's based on around 1.4 million MMBTUs of natural gas, which are traded each week. And so gas trades at around $3 per MMBTU. This is used to determine payments on an extremely large volume of contracts. So it's used to determine payments on a volume of contracts that's around 70 times larger than the volume of natural gas that's actually traded. So basically, relatively small markets are used to discover prices that are used for economically very, very large purposes. So a large volume of bets are being settled on a relatively small amount of underlying trade. Why is this potentially a fragile situation? Suppose we have a manipulator. And suppose our manipulator holds a relatively large bet tied to gas prices. So basically, suppose the manipulator holds a bet which says, I'm going to get paid 10 million times whatever the average price of natural gas is. So our manipulator, if she does nothing, is just going to have a contract which pays her $30 million, which is just the number of contracts that she holds times the average price at which natural gas is trading. But the fact that she holds such a large bet means that she can possibly do better. If the manipulator goes in and buys a bunch of natural gas that she doesn't need, then she can possibly push the natural gas price benchmark up to $5 per MMBTU. And then, so this is bad for her in the underlying market because she's buying a bunch of natural gas that she doesn't need at inflated prices. Why does this benefit her? Because she's just raised her contract payoff on her much larger contract position from $30 million to $50 million. So what does this example show? This example basically illustrates that price discovery is manipulable. When people have incentives to move prices around, for example, because they have contracts tied to these prices, and when people have the ability to move prices because the underlying markets where prices are coming from are relatively small and then people can easily move those prices, people have incentives to go into these underlying markets and then make trades, which are not their fundamental supply and demand for natural gas in order to move these prices around and profit from the bets that they're making on prices. Why do we not want this to happen? Because if we want market prices to reflect sort of fundamental supply and demand, so that we get it, the prices are informative about this fundamental supply and demand. Every time that people are writing bets on these prices, these bets are changing the nature of the fundamental supply and demand that goes into constructing prices. So 
Price discovery is manipulable. Anytime we are using prices for a reason other than resource allocation, there's going to be some incentive to move these prices around. One response we could have to this is to just ban manipulation. Force everyone to trade only according to fundamental supply and demand. This is effectively what re regulators currently do. Regulators ban manipulation. Congress banned manipulation in law and said it is illegal to manipulate or attempt to manipulate a price. Congress didn't take up the responsibility of defining manipulation and instead passing it to the regulators. The regulators then looked at this and said, well, let's define manipulation as trading with the intent to create artificial prices that don't reflect fundamental supply and demand. Now there's an interesting question. When we look at a market and we look at someone buying a bunch of gas, are they buying according to fundamental supply or demand or not? How can we tell? It's sort of extremely difficult to figure out the motive of people making trades, and so it's extremely difficult in practice to prosecute price manipulation. There's a lot of allegation of manipulation of various kinds of prices, foreign currencies, gold, oil, and so on, but it's very hard to ever tell whether a price is artificial or not. What does the current state of regulation look like? Here's some quotes from uh, the CFTC's proceeding on price manipulation in a number of cases. So State Oil is an oil company that was accused of manipulating oil prices. They said, if we're buying 17 cargos, there's only a few days where we'll not be able to have a good impact on the Argus quote price. So this is basically from the CFTC bringing a legal case against State Oil. Uh, State oil. Kraft Foods was accused of manipulating wheat prices. And they said, since Monday, we have stopped or stopped selling 2.2 million bushels of wheat. As expected, the December-March spread has narrowed approximately 11 cents. So these guys are large traders in markets. They make big trades. They know that their trades move prices around. And so basically, sometimes their trades move prices, and they acknowledge that their trades move prices, and that lets the CFTC find them billions of dollars. So the problem with using trading with the intent to create artificial prices as a standard for regulation is it often spills over is trading. When you trade and you know that you move prices, we can find you millions of dollars. So another example of this happening is Bank of America was, assumed, uh, was accused of uh, manipulating an interest rate swap benchmark. They said, so by paying all these five year spreads, were we trying to push the price in a certain direction or were we just trading for our position? So these guys don't even seem to be sure themselves whether they're manipulating with their trades or not. So in a world where your trades move prices, sort of your trades move prices whether you want them to or not. So it seems like a regulatory framework which makes trades that move prices, um, something that can be fined millions of dollars, seems to create a lot of regulatory uncertainty for these participants. So what I'm trying to do in my work is ask, is there a different way to do this kind of regulation? Can we step back and look at sort of the fundamental structure of this system? Prices from an underlying market being used to set price benchmarks, which people are writing large bets on and ask, how robust is this system? How robust is price discovery? How large can your contract positions be? How large bets can you hold based on a market price before you have overly, overly large incentives to manipulate that market price? Is it possible in this natural gas case to have these 75 million size MMBTU contract positions and relatively small underlying positions without creating overly large incentives to manipulate? And what features of markets affect the robustness of price discovery? So that's what I'm trying to answer in this paper. And to answer this, I set up a simple model. So without going into the formal details of the model in my paper, what I do is I have a model where traders hold contracts, which are tied to these price benchmarks. And I assume that basically traders can move these prices with their trades. So a trader who holds a long contract, so a contract that says if this price benchmark is higher, then I get a higher payoff, wants to buy the underlying asset, say gas, in order to increase the price benchmark and increase how much her contract pays off. What disciplines her ability to do this? The trader can't buy an unlimited amount of gas because she needs to expend costly capital to buy the gas and because she needs to store the gas. And basically, she is disciplined in her ability to move prices because her marginal utility for gas is decreasing. So that as she buys gas, um, she's accumulating more and more gas and decreasing her marginal utility. So basically, in my model, I construct a core trade-off that any uh, attempted price manipulator faces. The marginal benefit of manipulation is how quickly their trades of gas are going to increase gas prices and thus increase the profits on their bets on gas prices. Marginal cost of manipulation is how quickly, when she buys gas, the manipulator's marginal utility for gas decreases. And basically, in optimally manipulating, a manipulator is going to trade off these two marginal benefits and marginal costs of manipulation. So basically, what I show in my paper is manipulation is difficult if markets are competitive. So basically, suppose there's n people 
who are symmetric, who are trading natural gas. And suppose that I want to move natural gas prices. In order to do so, I have to buy enough natural gas to, decrease, to increase the marginal utility of everyone else in the market for natural gas by one unit before I can change natural gas prices by one unit. That's really costly for me because it, it decreases my marginal utility for gas a lot. So basically, if there's a, in a market with n agents, trades move prices n minus 1 times more slowly than they move my own marginal utility for gas. And so what this implies is that manipulation incentives are small in competitive markets. Trading just to move prices and change how much my, my bets on, on, on prices pay off is very costly when markets are competitive because I move prices very slowly and have to accumulate a lot of undesired quantities of the underlying assets in the process. This I show is surprisingly quantitatively precise. So we can actually calculate for each cost, for one contract that an agent holds, how much physical natural gas is she going to trade. In a market with n agents, basically, one contract is going to make you trade only 1 over n units of natural gas. So basically, 10 traders, 1,000 MMVTs of gas, you're going to only trade a relatively 1 tenth of that in physical gas. What this implies is that basically what we observe in practice, which, which is that we are writing very large volumes of bets on relatively small volumes of trade used to generate these prices. That does not necessarily imply that these markets are manipulable. Because contract markets, the volume of bets written based on a market price, can be around n times bigger than the volume of trade that actually goes into constructing that price before manipulation um, dominates the um, trade that's going into constructing the price. So this mostly it motivates a very simple index that we can use to, to evaluate whether a market can be manipulated. Take the volume of contracts, basically the volume of derivative contracts, the volume of bets that we're writing based on prices. And then divide that by n times the volume of trade that actually goes into constructing that price. And what I show is basically that the, if this index and a generalization of this, if agents are asymmetric, can be used as an indicator of whether these markets are susceptible to manipulation, manipulation or not. And then this leads us towards a potentially very different approach to regulating these markets. Rather than going in and trying to case by case find if people are manipulating, trying to move prices, like you're manipulating, you send a bad email, you um, seem to be making these trades with bad intent, we can just structurally regulate these markets. We can regulate how big bets people can hold. We can regulate sort of which markets are used to construct the important price benchmarks. And then we can regulate those and try and keep these um, ratio, this ratio relatively small. And then conditional on this kind of structural regulation, we can just leave the markets alone. And then let competition discipline how much agents are trying to move these prices around without the need for case by case going in and trying to find cases of manipulation. So what I've shown is basically that price discovery is surprisingly robust. Large volumes of bets can be written on prices formed using relatively small volumes of trade. This doesn't mean that we should just leave the markets alone all the time, because price discovery is not infinitely robust. If we calculate these ratios and we find that the volume of bets is more than n times larger than the volume of trade going into the benchmark, then we should do something to this market. We should try and move to a more robust underlying market where there's more competition. We should try to constrain how big bets people can write or something like this. So basically, this, just, this leads to an approach where regulators should monitor derivative contract markets and try and intervene in some ways when basically these ratios are too large. This is the main point of my paper. So I'm constructing a framework where instead of the current behavioral approach, where we look in and look for cases where agents are trading to move prices around, we can go in and structurally try and regulate these markets. A problem is that, for simplicity, I have mostly analyzed derivative contract markets where people are writing explicit bets on contracts. But a lot of price discovery in the economy is actually implicit. So people are sort of implicitly using prices for various purposes in a way that is hard to explicitly keep track of in terms of contracts. So what are some examples? Exchange rates, for example, are important for a variety of reasons. People use them to, for example, keep track of um, sort of. An example is, for example, the China US dollar exchange rate is a very political price. It is a price that tells you a lot about sort of how China US relations are doing, the relative strength of different parties in the trade war, and so on and so forth. One way to view this is that people have some kind of utility for the price being higher or lower, which is not just tied to its role in allocating resources. But the question is, how big is that utility? How much does the US government or the Chinese government want the exchange rate to go upwards or downwards? And sort of how much does that 
distort prices in the imperfectly competitive foreign exchange market. Another example, prediction markets. So an interesting case, um, which a um, which a options trader told me about, is that apparently there was a time in which there was a robust correlation between Brexit prediction market odds and foreign exchange rates. So what some traders thought was going on was there were a bunch of hedge funds who were trading foreign exchange, and they were feeding into their foreign exchange pricing models, Brexit odds, and their Brexit odds basically came from Googling and then looking at prediction market odds. So you can basically view this as of extremely large foreign exchange market is basically deriving its prices from an extremely small prediction market. And so it seems like it's really hard to track all cases in which this might be happening in practice, where sort of one relatively large market is effectively priced using prices discovered in, an extreme, in a much smaller market. So then there's a question of whether we can characterize the size of these relationships and whether these small markets are competitive enough to sustain these large volumes of price discovery. Commodity prices. So similarly, a lot of commodity prices are sort of important for not simply sort of allocated reasons. Oil prices, gold prices, all of them have, are, are important to inform us about sort of the state of the economy. The government often either has or is accused of having reasons to want to keep sort of major commodity prices, energy prices, gold prices, in earlier times wheat prices, higher or lower. And the question is basically, um, in an imperfectly competitive market, is the sort of implicit volume of contracts written on these prices um, large enough that, or small enough that price discovery in these markets is relatively robust. And then so my analysis basically is a first step in the direction of analyzing and structurally regulating price discovery. So if we can see the size of bets, we can see how much people care about a given market price. And then we can see how competitive the underlying market is. My analysis tells you how you can regulate these markets. I think an important question for further research is to ask how large are these implicit derivative contract positions? When people have preferences for prices to go in one direction or another, how large are those preferences? And are the underlying markets competitive enough to support this volume of price discovery? So what I'm doing is a first step in this direction of the question is, how do we take a structural approach to regulating price discovery? And then um, this is an important, this is um, some of the reasons why I think it's important, an important direction for further research. I'm a few minutes early, thanks. So we can uh, take uh, questions uh, now for Anthony? Yeah. Yes. You didn't say very much about what your alternative regulatory process would look like. Could you just elaborate on that a bit more? So regulators intervene in these markets structurally. They uh, impose limits on the size of uh, contracts people can hold. And then they also sort of try and redesign these markets, for example, moving from LIBOR, uh, manipulable interest rate benchmark, to SOFR, which they view as less manipulable. And so they are trying to use uh, structural <laughs> regulatory tools already, but they basically lack measures to guide sort of how to use these tools. They don't know when to, how to tell whether a market is, not mani is manipulable or not. And so basically what I'm saying is use the same tools you have before, but use them guided by the metrics I have to tell you how big manipulation incentives are likely to be in a given market. Can I just follow that up? Just yeah. I mean, one way to re maybe re rephrase the question is, can you do an analysis of existing markets and tell us which markets look more susceptible to manipulation? So basically, my analysis suggests that manipulation doesn't just depend on sort of how big the bets are and how big the volume of trade is. It also depends on market power. So prices discovered in competitive markets are quite hard to manipulate. And you can write extremely large volumes of bets on them without them moving. So if you believe that basically the foreign exchange interest rate markets, for example, are fairly competitive, most of the capital in the world is basically flowing into these markets, these should be quite hard to manipulate. And so pretty large fines have been charged for manipulating these markets. And one question is basically whether it is indeed possible for any agent to be big enough to move these prices. On the other hand, there are sort of some markets that are structurally concentrated. So energy markets have a relatively small number of traders, um, just because of the fact that returns to scale make it so that the optimal scale of production in oil, gas, and so on markets is pretty high. So it is conceivable that some agents in the short run have market power to sort of make prices go in, uh, that, that, that big oil traders, uh, BP, Shell, and so on, have enough market power to move prices in a given direction in a short amount of time if they hold large enough bets to justify doing so. So that's basically what my analysis points to. How competitive the underlying markets are determines is an important determinant in how manipulable these prices are. Um. 
in speculative markets, uh, usually the entire world could participate in any one market, and they usually choose not to because they don't see a pricing opportunity. Is that case N7 billion, or? So if you believe that is true. So basically, if you believe that everyone is looking at prediction markets all the time and would enter if the, if the odds moved against what they thought they would be, then my analysis suggests that even if you see zero volume in prediction markets, there is no manipulation possible. So, so no. actually, there is a literature that I contributed to yeah. on manipulation in prediction markets or financial markets yeah. that suggests that as the incentive to manipulate increases, the price accuracy increases. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's less and I think the problem, um, it's the other way. I speak essentially in uh, to a similar force in my paper, and I, I um, which is basically agreeing with you that sort of the size of contract positions being larger actually gives you the potential to profit more from fixing the price uh, mispricings. And, but I think sort of. It is an empirical question, I think, in practice, how well these forces of entry work, in the sense that you could have prediction markets that people are paying sufficiently little attention to that the prices aren't, in, practi are in practice, pretty manipulable. So I think that it is entirely possible that very small prediction markets are robust enough to settle extremely large volumes of bets on, but sort of there are some empirical caveats in, get in getting to that point. Yeah. yeah. I'm a member of the Princeton Club of 71, so I want to order people in this audience. And I still remember that, I believe it was in 1980, that Hunt Brothers tried to corner the silver market. And uh, I, uh, are you familiar with that episode? Yes. Okay, and, uh, the, uh, and now I understand the palladium price is very high. And there are anecdotal <coughs> evidence of people stealing catalytic converters from cars. You know, this would get the palladium out of that. And so uh, my question to you is that uh, precious metal markets tend to be much smaller than natural gas markets. So that uh, do, do you feel that the, the price discovery mechanism in precious metals to be a, a robust one? And secondly, do you see a, a, a period, I mean, episode similar to the Hunt Brothers episode happening in precious metal markets? So I think that precious metals are a very good example. Precisely because sort of the price of gold, for example, to a reasonable number of people has sort of economic sort of informational importance independently of its economic importance. So they see something in gold about sort of where the economy is going, whether we are in a recession or not, and sort of it is a, the informational value of the price is very important. Gold is actually an example that I analyze in my paper. So I show that gold is sort of borderline. There is a London gold price, which is formed by basically five to 11 dealers trading, previously five, but now it's more competitive. And so this is sufficiently uncompetitive that where the size of bets that these people were holding based on this price sufficiently large, they might have incentives to move it around. So what I show is that sort of empirically, given the current size of derivative contract positions, um, sort of, of gold futures contract positions, the London gold auction is competitive enough to settle the current size contract positions that people are holding. And so the empirical question sort of moves, it goes, goes in favor of, non, of, of, of that the London gold price is fairly robust. But sort of its borderline, where, where the size of bets that people were holding in these markets sufficiently large, the number of people is sufficiently small that, they could, that, that, that there is the potential for manipulation. Yeah, well, I mean, among precious metals, yeah. gold is probably the biggest market. Yeah. And, uh, and palladium is probably a lot smaller. Yeah. And the lithium, which is very important right. for batteries, is probably also a very small yeah. market. So, I mean, do you see yeah. people trying to? Yeah. So I haven't looked into the other precious uh, metals markets. That would be an interesting. That would be a very interesting direction to go. Yeah. Uh, how much more time do I have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a couple more. Thank you. I have a question about um, how should we think about this uh, competition element in, in, in markets where, for some institutional reasons, the, the number of people that actually uh, decide on these benchmarks are small. I, wish, I mean, I don't know much about other markets, but think about LIBOR, right? So LIBOR is used to price you know, most of the world's private debt in some sense. That's a, most of the most important reference rate. And now the US, for example, I think it's 16 or 17 banks, right, that essentially decide on or that uh, submit some information on which you know this live was computed, right? So obviously that's a very small number of banks, right? So how should we think about these kind of institutional arrangements? Is that just a bad idea or you know what what, what, what can you say about that? So two comments. So LIBOR is a slightly different example. Because in my model basically I analyze what happens when you can move prices by trading, by buying something. 
In LIBOR, you don't move prices by trading. You just move prices by lying about trades that you made or trades that you didn't make. <laughs> so sort of uh, what I think is generally a good design decision is to, in general, to the extent possible, base prices on verified or verifiable trades. And so the new interest rate benchmark was the SOFR, which is based on uh, treasury-backed overnight repo, sort of a base that principle. Question is, SOFR is still pretty small. So SOFR is $800 billion a night. Total volume of outstanding interest rate derivatives is like 200 trillion. So this ratio is still a bit big. If you do the calculation, however, so this 200 trillion is for derivatives which are settled on many different dates. If you think that basically the volume settling on any given date is in the order of a couple trillion dollars, and then you have 16 dealers, basically what my analysis shows is that you can settle basically the volume of trade that goes into this calculation times the number of trading. So basically my analysis says that we can have roughly $2 trillion of interest rate derivatives settling on SOFR every day. Sorry, $20 trillion of interest rate derivatives settling on SOFR every day. So it seems like sort of you can't have the entire volume of outstanding settling on one day, but it's entirely possible that SOFR is robust enough quantitatively to settle this volume of interest rate derivatives. Like another way to say this is 16 is a relatively big number. You can settle 16 times as much uh, approximately as the volume of trade that goes into calculating the benchmark. You're, I think you're hinting a little bit at, at the answer to my question. I think it's, it's fascinating how you found this, this, this mathematical relationship on manipulation between the size of contracts and the size of the underlying market. Um, a slightly different angle, has your research shown anything about that relationship <coughs> on the fragility of the markets, um, not as a manipulation issue, but simply as that this is sustainability of those markets, their risk for, for overshooting, for melting down, et cetera. Um, have you found a sense of any kind of mathematical relationship there as a direct part of your research, or is that something uh, tangential that, that someone else would, would focus on? So I haven't uh, directly addressed that point. One could perhaps look at that kind of question as sort of, if there is sufficient informational feedback where so a price is going up, that leads us to infer something about the economy that infers the price is going to go up further. You could sort of have these similar kinds of informational feedback relationships be basically the ex uh, an explanation for sort of high volatility in prices and feedback loops. And basically, something moving in one direction gives us a reason to believe it'll keep going, moving in one direction for a while. I haven't explicitly. Uh, so I haven't looked at that much in this paper, but one could try and ca characterize whether basically like my feedback relationship tied sort of in a positive feedback loop, and one could ask whether that relationship is sort of the positive feedbacks are big enough to generate basically unstable instead of stable dynamics. But I haven't looked at that at all. It seems like there's one version of that question that your paper does directly address, which is imagine you have an idiosyncratic shock in each individual firm, and you want to ask, is that going to an aggregate? Sorry, you have an idiosyncratic shock to each individual firm, and is that in, in aggregate going to move the price level a significant amount? Yeah. And probably at some level with your linear structure, that's almost exactly the same question yeah. as the question of how, what do you yeah, but I think what's missing from my framework is there's a lot of smoothness in my framework in the sense that sort of a small bet on prices has a small and bounded effect on the price itself. Whereas if you thought there was a feedback loop where basically changing the price changes the effective size of the bet that people are holding on the price, you can have a dynamic where you have an ever spiraling sort of massive bets on the prices and you have an ever increasing incentive to push the price in a given direction. But I haven't looked at that in this paper. Let me ask one last question. Um, how do, the, the number n is important, obviously, here, and you're assuming that those to be independent. What if they can conclude? Uh, yeah. Like that? So, so collusion. I mean, 16 sounds like a small enough number that people think. Yes, yes, yes. So, collusion is a problem for this analysis, and I think it's a problem that in the, what I base this. So, my paper is very much inspired by the antitrust approach to regulation. But even in antitrust, sort of the way we punish collusion is we look for people emailing each other and then we punish them. So sort of my model assumes people don't collude. And so effectively, the only way we have to discipline that is to force them not to collude by sort of behavioral It's like discipline. low benchmark. You're basically giving us, I can think of that as a low benchmark. Even Under the assumption of yeah, perfect exactly. competition. So if yeah. you allow for collusion, yeah. then 
Yeah. So my analysis does allow you also to analyze sort of the manipulation incentives of a cartel. So essentially, basically, a car, a one person who's 10% of the market um, has a sort of 10% incentive to manipulate. A person, sort of a cartel with 30% of the market has around 30% incentive to manipulate. So I can analyze that. But sort of, I think that detecting and punishing collusion in these and other antitrust settings is a difficult problem, which so far we're largely doing behaviorally in the sense of digging through emails and trying to punish people when we catch them doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, one more question. Can you speak a little to the role of market power for market makers and their structural role in these markets? So many of the benchmarks, the price, bench, the derivative contract markets that I'm looking at are essentially dealer markets. So the, base, the gold price benchmark that I'm looking at is um, there's a gold price benchmark determined by trade between dealers. So the auction just excludes non-dealers from participating. I think that one way of viewing things is that sort of dealers exacerbate market power where the number of traders in the markets who are sort of, the number of people who want to buy and sell gold is very large, but the number of, but all those trades go through around five to 11 gold dealers and thus sort of each of those has substantial short run market power. Nonetheless, I think that one way of interpreting my analysis is that if you have roughly sort of five to 10 dealers, that's enough to sustain a large volume of bets. Not an infinite volume of bets, but a large number. But your intuition, I think, is exactly right. That sort of dealers, sort of by sort of serving as concentrated intermediaries for trade, also increase market power more than sort of what you would think they would be, given like the number of people, individual agents in the economy who want to buy or sell oil, gas, gold, and so on. Thanks. Uh, Thanks.